Welcome to HQLA. This is the world's essential podcast. Yeah. And I am Isaac, and I'm joined by... Nathan. And uh, this is the beginning. This is the first episode that we've done. This so very uh, exciting. A little bit of understanding, but we're going to uh, do our best to make this interesting, informidable, and relevant. We'll see. Uh, Whoa, cool sound. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's where we'll put the cut. I'd just like to say, are we sure we're going to go with that intro? Oh, that doesn't have to be the intro. It's just, it's just kind of like, that's warming up, you know? No, it's in that music. Are we happy with that? Oh, well, we can we can shift it. If you're not happy with it, I want to make sure... No, I'm happy with it. Yeah, we'll go with I it. I want to make sure you're happy no, with it. No, I was just asking. Okay. Well, yeah, we'll go with it. All right. It's pretty pretty good. Okay, so I was looking at... um, I was looking at a company recently. I've actually been looking at it for a while. And it's actually really relevant at the moment. It's called Neo. Neo, okay. Yeah, have you heard of it? Yes. Do you know um, what they do? So this is the this is the competitor for kind of Tesla. But yeah. No, not that's really. a fair comment. They they do some similar things. So obviously, a few fundamental differences. Uh, the headquarters is in Shanghai, China, uh, as opposed to the US. Yeah. Wow. Okay. But they still specialize in EV vehicles. Um, but they don't make their own um, technology um, to automate. That's electric vehicles. Vehicles for everyone out there. Um, yes, that's true. Yes. <laughs> so the difference, also another difference. So Tesla's about seventeen years old, um, whilst Neo's only five. Uh, so they're much newer. Yep. Founded by a guy named William Lee, and um, they have four cars on sale. No, so the first time I saw this company was um, on Top Gear. Yeah. And okay. I didn't necessarily put two and two together until actually quite recently, once I saw the video again on YouTube. Um, but basically, they've got this car called an EP9, which is uh, I think you'd call it a hypercar. It's an electric hypercar, and um, there's an episode on Top Gear where Richard Hammond's driving it around the test track. Now, is this the one where he was in the French countryside and he has this huge crash down the mountain? It's not that one. It's not that one. Okay. No. Uh, but I don't think it's that one. That's I, a good question. I don't, I don't think it was. I, was <laughs> I, I know that it was an electric car that he, or maybe it was a hybrid, that he crashed down the... Um, yes, he did. He definitely did crash a hybrid down. Uh, down that embankment. I don't think it is. Okay, so this car, it's epic. Um, he's like losing his mind. I think he's driving it on the Top Gear test track. He's not yeah, on, yeah. on some French um, windy road. And so it's got like this headrest that comes around to stop your head from moving. Oh, like the G-forces. It, yeah, yeah, so extreme G-forces. He's generally pretty impressed. So that was uh, some years ago now. Since then, they've only sold 15 of those cars. 15? Yeah, so it's not so that's a... a very, that would be a very expensive um, model. It is, it is. I actually don't know what the price is. We could... Uh, I don't even know if you, you can actually buy it. You might have to be um, on, a, on a list to buy it. Yeah, wow. So they've got two other cars, which are actual cars to sell to the They're general commercial. public. Yeah. And so there's EC6 uh, and EC... ES6 and ES8. And so they're all just SUVs. So currently, really to the public, all they sell is SUVs. So they've got an SUV, they've got two SUVs yes. and a... And a full-size. So two mids and a one full-size SUV. Oh, right. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Yep. So yeah, so there's there's one large and two mid-size SUVs currently. And there's somewhere, they're, they're between 50 and 70 USD, uh, depending on the options that you choose, uh, which compared to Tesla is definitely cheaper. Uh because a Tesla Model X is going to run you more like 120. Yeah, wow. Yeah. So there's a few fundamental issues and then there's a few interesting things. So <clears throat> uh, the factory is owned by the, the the Chinese Communist State. Yeah, that's um okay, that's an interesting one. It's not one. owned by Neo. <laughs> and so um so that's the factory that they produce Neo in. Yes, they, they don't own the factory? Is it like some kind of lease, would you assume, or I don't know what the legal arrangement is. Okay, yeah. But essentially, uh, the state makes the vehicles for them, which, if you're comparing that to Tesla's, is is a fundamental issue because one of Tesla's <coughs> main advantages is all the machinery that they build to streamline and scale the process, the manufacturing process, mm. right? So they're putting time and effort and engineers into building machinery that will ultimately make it so much easier to scale up um, the manufacturing process of the cars. Yeah, and and with the government doing that, like they have no control over. They have no control. Yeah, over wow. It. So, um, Neo then takes full risk for any disruptions in the factory and stuff like that. So, if they're trying to become profitable, um, they the 
the levers that they can pull or the I guess the the powers that they have are fairly limited because um, they're essentially like they they don't own the manufacturing process of the cars themselves and they don't own the actual autopilot function either so the autopilot function is um, mobile eye um, it's a company owned by Intel since 2017 and uh, there's actually 16 million cars right now on the road with mobile eye and it's the same wow, techno- I've never even heard of it it's the same technology that Volvos have and BMWs and stuff like that where you drive along the motorway and if someone breaks in front of you it'll break yeah okay is that is that like a some kind of lidar system no uh, it's a it's a camera system it is a camera system okay yeah. and um, well it it originally was a camera system and then uh, the company that were doing lidar somewhere around 2018 or 2019 uh, it wasn't it was becoming the problem with lidar is the technology involved is was becoming quite um, expensive and so um, that's why they saw the, the camera side of it to be more profitable. Mm. So anyway, um, one thing that Neo is, one cool thing about Neo is they have the virtual assistant. I don't know if you've ever seen it. I haven't seen that. Okay, it's, it's worth looking up. There's a, a virtual assistant. So are they, are they, is this like in, in your car, yeah. in the middle screen? No, well, it's, it's a little pod that sits on the, oh, this is amazing. the front of the dash and yep. it's got two eyes and a mouth and it constantly, <laughs> it dynamically moves constantly. And it talks to you. It currently only talks in um, Mandarin. So uh, are we talking sad face if you start breaking traffic rules? Yeah, definitely. Go, go, through, a, go through a red light. It pulls a little sad face at you. <laughs> says the government's watching. <laughs> yeah. I'm not sure if it responds to you the way you drive, but it, it definitely has um, emotional you know, responses wow. and stuff like that. So, yeah, it, it feels like your, your That's friend. That's such a funny idea. It is. Yeah. It's, a, it's a very... Um, or it does feel like a Chinese thing. Like they love that kind of um, the interaction, and the, the interaction with technology, yeah, and yeah. the the um, almost emotional interaction with technology. Yeah. Um, a few key, uh, a few other key um, stats would be that in um, in in Q two uh, this year, um, Neo had sold uh, ten thousand vehicles in China. Tesla had sold 30,000 just Model S's in China. Yeah, wow. Okay. So yeah. there's obviously a disparity in quantity. One's 17 years old, one's five years now, old. Now, that's interesting because of how quickly China scales up. So it's yeah. almost like next year Tesla will do, say if Tesla does 50,000, yeah. you know, who cares? <laughs> Neo's doing 120,000. Yeah. You know, like it's almost like they'll, they'll catch up almost immediately, but yeah. Potentially. So the other issue is that because... Neo don't own the manufacturing process and they don't own the mm, huge problem technology. Yeah, uh, their profit margin is currently somewhere around five percent per vehicle, whilst Tesla's is somewhere around twenty four percent. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And they and they almost can't do anything about it without having that control. See what I see this yeah. company as? It's kind of like a bank in a way. Yeah. Because. Uh, in a bank, you're almost completely controlled. Like your profits are almost completely controlled by the government so like yeah. in in Australia that's what like that's what it is you, they set a rate and then you have to follow the rate you know mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. so it's it's like um you you've got limited control over your profit and then you can only pull a certain number of levers that's um yeah. that i could see as a huge problem for investors yeah no absolutely um and then on top of that there's a few other ones um there's obviously the US coming out and saying that they're going to um going to pull these Chinese companies off the US stock exchange if they don't comply. And uh, there's, a, there's a bunch of other uh, Chinese EV companies um, that are somewhat less known than NIO and, and obviously Tesla being US as well. Um, I think NIO is so well known just because it became uh, the meme stock of uh, it, the last couple of months. It definitely uh, has. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and but uh, I mean, a spokesperson from from Neo has come out and said that they are going to make every effort to comply, um, and they got three years to actually make the changes needed to um, comply with the U.S. stock exchange. Yeah. Um, so uh, and then something that actually happened last night is that Neo um, made an announcement that they're going to raise more capital. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And so um, they just injected sixty million new shares into the US now, did they stock exchange. Did they just announce that because Tesla announced it the day before? <laughs> because <laughs> did, they did, did Tesla announce it the yeah, day they, before? Yeah, they announced the capital raising um, really? two days ago. Really? Um, like just before, the day before Airbnb uh, went public. Yeah, right. Yeah. And so last night it dipped a fair bit, I think like 7%. Yes. Um, um, so what was really weird was when Tesla announced their capital raising, 
they actually went up in uh, value. I was going to say. Um, which I didn't is, notice a decline. Yes, which is so strange. It's, it's, um, yeah. it's irrational behavior, but um, everyone's getting diluted yeah. and they're buying more because yeah. they're like, well, uh, it's a good company. <laughs> well, in saying that, though, Tesla may be a little more open in what they're doing with the capital and that yeah. might excite people. That's true. Whereas Neo haven't really said what they're going to do with it. Yeah. For all we know, just it's just it to, to pay government. wages and give to the government to <laughs> yeah. build their cars. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I can understand people's hesitancy. Um, so, yeah, uh, it, it's a very interesting... Uh, company and as you sort of said initially I think it is whilst it doesn't have a lot of control over certain elements um, I think it's somewhat similar to a lot of other companies um, in that space like there'd be a lot of other companies who are using uh, the same uh, autopilot technology and um, Tesla's you know Tesla is in a great position where they are building their own technology actually the version one cars of Tesla use this same technology okay and there's a, there's some sort of article out in around 2017 where uh, at least one or two Tesla cars had really big incidents and crashed oh yeah yeah and I it, remember this it, it was yeah. actually using this technology yeah okay and then at that point they broke away and um, designed their own yeah, wow. Um, so it's, it's crazy having the budget to do something like that in-house. That's yeah. um, that's where the real, like, yeah, mm-hmm. that's where the real money is. So, yeah. I mean, Tesla's great. Neo's cool. I think they're the next biggest competitor, in my opinion. And uh, I'd still watch the space. Um, but, uh, yeah, certainly not in the same strong position as Tesla. Yeah. There you go. So, yeah. Are we talking, like, little little sound effects? I think yeah. so. Yeah, all right, cool. Yeah. All right, so I've got an interesting one um, okay. to pitch for you. All right. This one is Palantir. So, okay. um, so this one became uh, became available only 51 days ago on the uh, on the stock market. Yeah. Um, right. So IPO'd pretty recently. It's been mm-hmm. around since 2003, 2004. So I actually, and I didn't know this, um, but uh, but it's a super interesting company. Uh, yeah. They've so they haven't made. Uh, it's one of those one of those classic uh, Silicon Valley tech um, companies. They haven't made a profit yet. Yeah, um, no, that's, still working on it. Yeah, it's know. fine. Um, they're getting there. <laughs> it's only been 15, 20 years, but uh, it's um it's an interesting one because it was started by um, Peter Thiel, who I think is a is a Y Combinator guy. Now, uh, mm-hmm. Y Combinator is such an interesting VC firm. It's a uh, if for anyone who doesn't know, it's a Silicon Valley um, venture capital. Uh, fund so they they'll fund a lot of ideas, and really like aggressively go after the ones that work. Yep. So uh, so one thing that's really funny about Palantir is that it's a data it's a data analysis and consolidation company. Mm-hmm. So they'll um, they'll take all that data and analysis, but their only client for a lot of years was the CIA. Um, yeah, right. So it's very cool kind of okay. secret spy sort of stuff. Hopefully our um, podcast doesn't get uh, banned for talking about this uh, this kind of um, secret um, Could I butt in? Yes. So it looks like uh, Peter Thiel uh, also co-founded PayPal. Yes. Um, so it seems that the people, everyone who has worked at PayPal yeah. has gone off and started a different company or five other companies. Because what, uh, um, Elon also, did he co-found or just CEO PayPal? I think Elon was the CEO for a bit. Yeah. And uh yeah, and he was um he was overthrown. Uh, that was such an interesting story. I haven't heard yeah. that before, but um he was overthrown by his own people when he <laughs> when he went on holidays. That's and, right. Um, but anyway, um Sorry. on uh, no on uh, on Palantir. Yeah. So they've got the CIA as a um as a main client. Mm-hmm. Um now they've picked up a lot more since then, but mm-hmm. it was initially founded immediately after like 9/11. Um uh. so that they could get the they could get the like. They pro- it's all about protecting the people that protect the country. Um, yeah. So that's like that's the kind of vibe of the company, mm-hmm. um, which is super. It's very James Bond, very Jason Bourne. Absolutely. Um, so you know it's quite cool. But um, yeah. but one of the things one of the things I saw that they were doing, they were building this technology mm. to track the insurgents in Afghanistan, who were making roadside bombs, and uh, and they could watch them on satellites um, using this kind of. Data consolidation. Now it's very, it's very creepy, Big Brother um, kind of yeah. ideas, but um, it's it's one of those things where um, where they we're taking all that massive amount of data and um, and kind of just making it really easy to use by by governments. Yep. And um, so they've got governments as clients, but they've wow. um, in the last few years they have uh, branched out to. They've got other clients like BP. Um, so BP use them for checking their 
um, checking their exhaust fumes and checking their yeah. oil depositories. And like they can use all the like camera data basically. They can consolidate it really quickly. Does that mean that they're going to be able to tell if people steal the fuel and they can just see their face? And well, probably. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, I was actually right. I was thinking more in terms of like I was I was thinking about like ocean drills. Like, okay. Ah, yeah, right. That's yeah, what I was. You're not thinking at the service station. No, not at the service station. <laughs> They're probably not looking at individual people. Well, you never know. They, they might, could be, right? They, they got be. the technology. They got the technology. They they might as well send it back. Right. But that's that's one of the things that you kind okay. of do. You you mass analyze all the cameras yeah. uh, around an area and yeah. for massive crimes that kind of thing. Wow. Um, but uh, but one thing was really funny that I found about this one. Yeah. They had a uh, J P Morgan was a huge client, so big really? big American bank. Uh Um, So they were a client for uh, a couple of years there, Uh, one of the first um, commercial clients. They've got, I think they've got a number of commercial clients now. Okay. But um, I think, so I think about 50% of their um, revenue comes from governments and about 50% is from um, commercial stuff. Okay. But they had JP Morgan and they don't anymore because the, there was like a, there's some kind of group inside JP Morgan that was running a... um, uh, an investigation, like an internal investigation, yep. is like their their little compliance squad kind of thing, mm-hmm. and they ended up just looking way too deeply into the executives' uh, lives and like kind of spying on them. Wow! Um, and so the executives are the ones with the budget, 100%. and they were just like, "Well, we're just going to cancel this contract with um, Palantir." Wow! Because they're giving them too they're make, giving them too much power. Yeah. So, yeah, it's an it's an interesting idea. Um, it's an interesting startup. It's and wild. It's really grown. It's grown. Um, about 150 percent in the last uh, 50 days, so it's pretty really pretty solid stock growth. I mean, we're seeing crazy increases now, so I don't even know if that's you know average, uh, but um, yeah, that's right. <laughs> no, definitely pretty good returns. So. That's yeah. definitely great. Wonder if it's sustainable. Yeah, well, it's um, it apparently, and this was just a one of the one of the classic Wall Street bets um, posts, but but someone someone knew that it was gonna IPO price at. Uh, Eighty dollars or something, yeah. and it ended up IPOing at something like ten. Um, but I don't know how much oh, of wow. the actual value is, like how much market cap difference there is. What's its price right now? Do you know? uh, it's at twenty-seven. I twenty-seven think. bucks. Yeah. Okay. Yep. So um, bought so, some, bought some call options uh, last night. We'll see where this one goes. Really? So it says here, Peter Thiel was the first outside investor in Facebook. Oh, there you go. So this guy's worth five point three billion US dollars. Yeah, he's a really interesting dude. Five point three is pretty interesting. <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, we should get him on the podcast. I think so. Yeah, the yeah, first guest maybe. So the other day, the other day I saw uh, Audi's new mid-size. Um, I don't even know if you'd call it mid-size. To be honest, it's not. So it's okay. Audi's new SUV. It's called RSQ8. Uh, the Q8's been out for a while. I think the RS Q8 um, followed it. Um, to me, it doesn't look as big as the Q7. It's a yeah, yeah. I've noticed that. Which doesn't make heaps of sense, but I could definitely be wrong about that. Um, but it's much sportier lines. So like the back of the the back of the car kind of slopes down, and maybe it makes it seem smaller. I don't know what its actual road size presence is. So it's pretty expensive. Has um, it got a wider? It's got like the wider front grille, doesn't it? Than the um, than the Q7. Yeah, like, definitely. Yeah, it looks extremely aggressive. Yeah. Even the even the Q8, the standard version, looks really really great. Um, RS Q8 looks extremely aggressive. So it's basically a. I've heard someone call it a super SUV. Super SUV. Wow. Yeah. Kind of like supercar, super SUV. Um, I mean, it's super in price. So it's 185k. It is super Australian, and uh, zero to 100. 3.8 seconds, um, which is supercar territory for sure. That's incredibly fast for an SUV. Okay, so it weighs 2.3 tons. Wow. So they're really so they've got something in there that's really pushing it along. Yeah. So, um, so it's it's 590 horsepower. <laughs> Seriously, and it's it's a four liter twin turbo V8. So it's the same engine that's in um, Lamborghini Urus, Bentley Bentayga, and the Porsche Cayenne Turbo. It's really, it's really competing with all those new SUVs because um, they're, yeah, that's that's the territory it has to beat, isn't it? Exactly right. The ones um, that don't care about full driving, yes. but do care about how fast their SUV goes. For what reason? I'm not sure. But they don't care about getting a sedan or a sporty shape. Exactly. So the Urus, it's it's the same platform as the Urus, 
So if you see a uh, Lamborghini Urus next to it, because yeah, because um, Audi owns uh, Lamborghini, don't they? That's right. Yeah, uh, it's all owned by Vol- uh, Volkswagen or something. Uh, there you go, Volkswagen Group or something like that. Um, and so the Urus has got an extra fifty horsepower, same engine, so it's just tuned slightly differently. <clears throat> and uh, but it's one hundred and thirty k more for the Urus. So you're almost, you're basically getting a discounted Urus. So um, everything else is very similar. So the Q8. That I mentioned initially, um, that came out slightly before. It's got 335 horsepower, so comparing to 590, and it's only a turbo V6. Um, so I watched a few uh, reviews on that one, and uh, people were saying it sort of felt as if it lacked in power a little bit, compared to a lot of Audi ranges where um, you know they're giving giving you V8s or twin turbo V6s or whatever it is. The single turbo uh, Q8 felt like it lacked a little in power, so this one's obviously t- uh, solved that problem. There's a few interesting packages. You get the carbon optics package. Carbon optics. Yeah, six thousand oh, six thousand Australian dollars. And that's that'll be just a look option, won't it? It's or, just a look option. Yeah. So, so it all you get is a bit of carbon around the front grille. Amazing. A bit of carbon on the caps for the mirrors, and a little bit of carbon just across the back of the uh, the trunk. Shout out to Audi's marketing team for um, <laughs> managing to actually they they will get clients who will want that. And uh, yeah, I've seen it's it on that the car. The add-ons are where the serious margins are because um, how much is that really costing them to put the you know fit out it a little bit negligible ten percent of that yeah yeah but you know how much are they really making on the standard car probably not as much you know potentially because it's not a be high scale production car like it's you don't see RSQ eights around very they could often. be making they could be making ten percent profit margin on their um, it's possible on their standard cars and then you start adding options and mm-hmm. bam thirty percent you mm-hmm. know. Uh, another option is called the Black Optics package. It's four thousand. You get twenty-three inch rims. Twenty-three. Yes. It's almost the size of my bike tire. That's very big. Yes. Um, and a few other black bits. And they've got a twelve thousand dollars ceramic brakes option, which is an interesting one. So it's carbon ceramic brakes. Um, not sure why you would need that unless you were tracking it. At which point, I don't know why you'd buy a RSQ8. That's true. Yeah. But if you've got the cash and you just want the best of the best, then you can... I mean, maybe it's just so heavy that they need to... Um, that's also true. I mean, if you were tracking it or if you were driving it aggressively, you're absolutely right. Yeah. You definitely get brake fade without carbon ceramic brakes. But true. I just don't see... I don't just don't see the point in it. But maybe that's not... The, the point is there's no point. Mm. It's luxury. Yeah. That's the point. People people like that. Um, there's a bunch of red stitching throughout the car and stuff like that. It's got this thing... Um, it's becoming quite popular now in a lot of luxury cars where um, the design of the air vents on the front dash, a few designers don't like the idea of having these little pods of, um, of vents kind of breaks up the lines and they, they want stream, like kind oh, of clean lines. Oh, yes, yeah. So you may have seen, it's kind of like it looks like a continuous vent yeah. all the way across. The portion that isn't usually a vent is still not a vent, but it just looks like a vent. Okay. So the vents are still in the same place, but it's just an interesting design feature that a lot of people have done. Yeah. It's a, it's a similar trend, not similar in aesthetic, but similar in timing to the, uh, you, you've seen the, the, the uh, indicators and now that they, they like swipe across yeah, the LEDs. Yeah, I've seen this, yeah, yeah. It's in a few cars now. The uh, yeah. first one I saw it was in an Audi and then now I've seen it in a bunch of different cars. Yeah. Um, that's also a really cool feature. That's, that's sorry, I distracted you there. Um, that's <laughs> um, <laughs> my mistake. No, that's fine. Uh, it's got heated seats in the back. Um, one really random thing is if you're sitting in the back, on both sides of the car, on both doors, you've got both um, buttons to put the windows up and down. Oh, so you can control the other person's. Correct. Yeah, okay. which is great if you've got a couple of kids in the back. It's very good. Yes, I love that. <laughs> That's a great feature. So we, you can definitely be locking those straight up. Yes, I um, I, I can't see it as the most family friendly car though. Um, no. I don't know. No, I think if you want to, the the most family friendly is going to be the Q7. Yeah, I yeah. Think you can get the seven seats, and uh, you can get the R uh, RSQ7. I think uh, you can get that, and I think that looks like a pretty killer car. That's I've seen. I don't think they make it anymore, but I've seen in the older revision. Uh, they make uh, like a a V a V12 um, Q7. I've seen a follow a guy on Instagram who's got a Q12 uh, a V12, V12 Q7. Yeah, wow. Yeah, that's yeah. a thing. I um, saw I saw a um, 
SQ7 last night. Yeah. Um, and uh, it makes an incredible sound. It makes a great noise. It's very good. Yeah, it's probably a similar engine. So, yeah. All right, I've got one other thing. Tell me the other thing. Do you have anything? Uh, I don't have any other thing. Okay, I got a thing. All right, tell me. Um, okay, so I was reading, reading this uh, the other day about, have you heard of a $20 auction? $20 auction, tell me about it. It's this experiment. I can see the title in here, but I've been interested in what it actually is all okay. morning. Okay, okay. Okay, so it's an experiment, this guy. It's this guy named Professor Max Basman um, in the US, and he teaches a negotiations class in the Harvard Business School. Okay, yeah. And um, he conducts this auction, and it's now become pretty famous. It's in a few books. It's in a book I, book I read recently. There's a few articles about it. I even uh, I was watching a National Geographic YouTube video last night, and they like redid this with a bunch of random people. This same experiment. It's really interesting because it 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 uh, people don't realize uh, the gravity of it when they're starting to bid. So I'll explain it. Okay, so. Um, at the start of each year, the, uh, Max Basman, he conducts this auction and say so with his first year class. So he says, all right, there's two rules. The bidding starts at $1 and increases in dollar increments. One, two, three. And then the second rule is that both the winner of the auction and the second highest bidder must fulfill their bids. Right, okay, right? yeah. So if I bid $20 and you bid $19... I have to give you $20, I get $20 because I was the highest bidder. Yeah. But you also have to pay $19 and you get nothing. Interesting. Okay. okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right. And so um, it's really inter- interesting because initially um, the bidding starts super quick. So only the winner wins and the second place has to give up their bid. Yes. Except. For nothing. Yeah. For nothing. Yep. And third place and lower Everyone than that else is, doesn't have to it's worry. It's just a normal auction. Okay. So it starts out quickly. Because everyone's thinking this is a great deal. So, you know, I can pay $4 and I'm potentially going to get a $20 note here. Yeah. And so they're all bidding. But the, the incentive then is if you're then the second highest, so if someone outbids you, you've got a lot of incentive to cover your losses to bid again slightly higher. So if I bid $5, you bid $6. My thinking is, well, I've, now I'm going to have to pay $5 for nothing. It makes logical sense for me to bid $7. And then you'd bid eight dollars, nine dollars, and so it gets up to nineteen, yeah, twenty dollars, yeah. and then now there's not multiple people, or there's not a, a great vast number of people in this auction anymore. It's just the two people left: one person who's the highest bidder, and the second person who's just trying to cover their losses and trying to become the highest bidder. And then obviously that's flipping back and forth. So you know, I'm bidding twenty dollars. Then you're bidding twenty one dollars for a twenty dollar note, mm. but the rationale for you is that if you pay twenty dollars and get nothing, you may as well pay twenty one dollars and get twenty back, and then you're only yeah. out of pocket one. And then you one. lose one dollar. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so <laughs> this goes on, and uh, so this is an actual thing. And so Basman says that he runs this auction, and the highest that it ever got to was two hundred and four dollars. That's incredible. Yeah, U.S. dollars. It's a lot of money. It's like you know ten thousand Australian dollars, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And, but uh, it'd only be two people that are actually. It's only two um, people bidding, and yeah. he says that he gives he gives the money to charity at the end of the class, yeah. but he actually makes them pay for it. Yeah, and he says it's a great experiment as to people making uh, seemingly irrational decisions uh, to try and cover their losses. Mm. And so, yeah, it's a really interesting experiment. I thought. Yeah, my my issue with like that is very interesting. My issue with this is. Mm. Uh, are people so is it is it that someone's dumb enough to continue bidding like or uh, because there's a point where there's a point where they're going from forty dollars to sixty dollars mm-hmm. for example and they've just lost the entire thing just because they're what do you too, mean from forty to sixty not in one increment no not in one increment but there's a point there's where a, the period of time where they went from forty to sixty yeah there's yeah. a period of time where they went from forty to sixty yep and were they like were they thinking oh well if I'd stopped it at forty yeah. I could stop it um, from going any higher. So why would I go from 60 to 80? Yes. You know, in my mind, that's what I would kind of be thinking. I guess what you're think I guess what they're thinking is um, if I can just outlast this person, then I'm going to save myself $20. Yeah. Yeah. And then the the main issue with that is obviously 
they could have saved themselves twenty dollars by stopping getting earlier. It's funny, but isn't it? It's like a greed kind of yes. irrational greed thing, mm-hmm. I guess. Mm-hmm. But it's like, very interesting. Uh, I can't even see it as greed though, because for me it would be greedy to stop. Like yeah. <laughs> it'd be like, yes, I'm cutting right here. Yeah. At twenty one. It's a little bit similar. It's a little bit similar to I. I read another story of this guy. I don't have really great details on it, but it's just similar to um, this guy who owned, he owned like a biochemistry company or something. He got bought out by this much bigger company. He got great stock options. Yeah. And it was something like $47 a share um, when he was given it in his package. And uh, he went to a financial advisor and the financial advisor said, well, you know, you've never invested in anything before. And so this is now 100% of your portfolio. He said, it's not really wise. Understand that you have emotional connection to it. It was your company. You now don't own it. You think it's great, but it would be smart for you to um, just distribute some of this a little bit to other asset classes or other stocks or companies or whatever to just try and manage your risk a little better. And he didn't like the idea. And so um, he wrote it down and then it was something like got down to like $30 or whatever. Went back and spoke to this financial advisor again and the guy says, well, you know, uh, it's clearly proven that it's gone down in price now. They're making changes that are negatively affecting the company. Um, You should really consider just selling now. But it's the same thing of like, uh, I guess it's, they're thinking, yeah, but I've lost this much already. Um... If I just hold on, maybe to like maybe I can win here. Like maybe somehow it's going to go back up in this situation. But maybe the other person's thinking in this auction. Well, maybe if I can just if I just go two more dollars more, you know, or two more increments more, maybe I'll win the twenty dollars and it's going to go much better for me. So I think I think that there's got to be a name for that fallacy. Like there has to be some kind of fool's errand. Is, um, it a bit of a sunk, <laughs> is it like a bit of a sunk cost kind of thing? I think it, it's a sunk cost, yeah. yeah. Where you have to just disregard, like you have to disregard the whole past. Yeah. Particularly in his situation. Yeah. And um, make a decision purely on the future. And with what you have control over, you have no control over what the other person is going to bid, but you do have control over stopping it going up and up and up and up and up for this auction. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, it's an interesting one. Two hundred four dollars. Two hundred four dollars, and they got twenty dollars. Yeah, that's um. Everyone loses. So that's obviously the point where they rational kicked in. Like they. Well, they maybe they didn't have more thinking. dollars than that. True. <laughs> maybe they just yeah. Maybe they would have just kept kept going forever. Like, maybe. Until they completely ran out that's of money. Doesn't make sense, eh? Yeah. It's crazy. Some people are wild, eh? Some people are crazy. I think um. That just about wraps us up for the, uh, you know the episode. What? I think that was episode one. I think uh, I think we've done a good job there. I think it was great. Did you have fun? This was HQLA, and yes, I did have fun. I had fun too. That is the most important podcast. The relevant podcast. We'll see you next time. I'm Nathan. And I'm Isaac. Goodbye. <laughs>